I've got a. But as long as we have this one for, I'm going to go this one for Paul. Yeah. And this one for Paul. And I've got a. It doesn't get great. It doesn't get crystal clear, but I can. Uh, I can put this in my mic. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, I Do you have? I didn't no, even ask you. Nothing. Okay. I'll just be. Okay. I'll just be reading and waving my arms around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I? Would you prefer this one? I don't know. Um, but we. We have a. We need a. There's a wireless mic if you'd like this. It doesn't matter. Yeah, perhaps. Okay. You can see, see, see more of me. People hate this because it's so long. <laughs> No, come on, Reed. And it's just right here. This is it. We uh, press the button on top. This one. This one. This way. Until it, until there's a green line. Got it. And now it's on. Mm -hmm. So press it maybe again, it'll turn amber, and that's muted as long as it's green. Clip it. Yep. Great. So we will turn it off. It's okay. muted for now. <laughs> and I'm sorry, you had a question for me. Um, yeah, the, the reception and dinner. What, what, where are we? So the reception will be right outside. Yeah. Um, I'll have it all set up afterwards. And then we're just one floor up for dinner. Yeah, in, in here. In the, in the in you yeah. never get outside. You never get to get outside. <laughs> do you want some water or anything for the podium? Uh, and do you yeah. prefer sparkling or, or regular? No. Okay, I will be back. So, it is some he nothing's going to speak there. Yeah. So, oh, 
he's going to use a, a lavalier. Fine. Okay. Right. Okay. And I'll just introduce them to you here. Okay. And good. Can I do I have no idea, okay. um, but I'm sure it will be revealed in time. Okay. Yeah. Give me just a second. I need to grab up some water. I heard speaker. Do you want to walk okay. in the water? Okay. okay. Do you need some help? No. Okay. 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 I just wondered if that
So. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to this conversation between Menachem Fish and uh, Paul Griffiths. I am Ellen Davis, Professor of Bible and Practical Theology here at the Divinity School, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you both my colleagues, uh, Menachem Fish holds the Joseph and Cecil Mason uh, Chair for History and Philosophy of Science at the University, University of Tel Aviv, where he is also Director of the Center for Religious and Interreligious Studies. He is also a Senior Fellow of the Kogod Center for the Renewal of Jewish Thought at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, where we have been colleagues for many years. Among other major honors and responsibilities, Professor Fish has served as president of the Israel Society for History and Philosophy of Science and as chair of the National Committee for History and Philosophy, Philosophy of Science at the Israel Academy of Science. Professor Fish has held visiting research posts at distinguished universities across the world in Oxford, Cambridge, UK, and Cambridge, Mass, Berlin, Frankfurt, Budapest, as well as the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Among many publications, I note a few titles that may give you some idea of the wide range of his thought. Rational Rabbis, Science, and Talmudic Culture, A Modest Proposal Toward a Religious Politics of Epistemic Humility, Taking the Linguistic Turn Seriously, and The View from Within, Normativity and the Limits of Self-Criticism. Joining Professor Fish for this conversation is Paul Griffiths, Warren Professor of Catholic Theology at Duke, who has long-standing interest and expertise in the philosophical and political questions arising from religious diversity. His recent publications include a commentary on the Song of Songs and forthcoming, perhaps, an expanded version of the Stanton Lectures delivered last year at Cambridge University entitled The End, an Eschatological Assay. We are delighted to welcome Professors Fish and Griffiths for a conversation about meeting the challenge of Nostra Aetate 50 years later. And we welcome you to join us for a reception with them following the lecture, which the lecture and conversation, which will end no later than half past six. Thank you. Professor Fish, please. Thank you, Anne. Uh, let me say again what I said at the, at the luncheon seminar, how delighted 
I am to be here, what a pleasure it is, and to thank Ellen and Abdullah Antepli, sitting over there, uh, uh, for organizing this visit. Thank you ever so much. So, the, the, the paper I'd like to present to you is, is called Drafting a Jewish Response to Nostra Aetate, or a Possible Jewish Response to Nostra Aetate. The documents comprising the Second Vatican Council of the mid-1960s constitute a major rethinking of Catholic belief, practice, and governance. But for a religiously engaged non-Catholic like myself, two of the documents stand out in particular, as particularly striking. The Declaration on Human Freedom, entitled Dignitatis Humanae, and the Declaration on the Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions, entitled Nostra Aetate. Dignitatis Humanae is a passionate affirmation of the right of all people to religious freedom, hailing the protection and respect of that freedom to be a solemn religious duty. And I quote, injury is done to the human person and to the very order established by God if the free exercise of religion is denied in society, end of quote. It states emphatically, it, it states emphatically, in, instructing Christians, and I quote again, at all times to refrain from any manner of action which might seem to carry a hint of coercion or of a kind of persuasion that would be dishonorable or unworthy, and condemning such actions, and I quote again, an abuse to one's right and a violation of the right of others. Now, it's extremely difficult to square one's commitment to the truths of one's own, one's own faith with a genuine obligation to respecting the right of others to live theirs, to live by theirs. Nonetheless, Dignitatis Humanae resolutely affirms the right to religious freedom, not as a matter of convenience or even a concern for the sake of peace, but as a matter of religious value. Nostra Aetate goes an extraordinarily step further, which becomes apparent when one realizes that the liberal obligation to allowing people to live as they see fit, however serious and deep, carries with it no obligation to take an interest, let alone attribute value, to the life they choose to live. Dignitatis Humanae solemnly recognizes everyone's right to the, to, to the religion of their choice. But just as in liberalism, what is solemnly respected and valued are not the, religious, the religions they choose, but the right they have to choose them. Nostra Aetate, by contrast, attributes sufficient religious value to the religious choices of other people over and above their right to make to urge Christians in the strongest terms to engage in religious dialogue and collaboration with practitioners of all other religions, especially Judaism, and to do so, I quote, with prudence and love. So taken together, Dignitatis Humanae and Nostra Aetate thus constitute a most positive, dramatic, and timely development in church doctrine on one that, with respect to religious pluralism, goes an intriguingly important step beyond liberal democracy, one to which Judaism and Islam have yet to respond. But can they? Well, I can only speak for Judaism, of course. Does Judaism offer resources capable of providing a serious and authentic religious incentive for considering other faith traditions to be of sufficient religious value to merit seriously engaging them in study and in dialogue. Can one even imagine an orthodox rabbi of standing dedicated to the study of Christianity with Christians and Islam with Muslims as a matter of solemn religious obligation? Well, far-fetched as it might seem, I believe such a response is forthcoming and capable of even going an interesting step beyond the two Roman Catholic documents. However, this is far from simple. 
For one thing, while Nostra Aetate builds on and away from Dignitatis Humanae, urging Christians to take a keen interest in the various ways different people exercise their right to their religions, I can see little way of affirming such a right from a Jewish perspective. A Jewish response to Nostra Aetate must be grounded differently in a manner that somehow drives a wedge between the two documents, welcoming adherence to other forms of religious and irreligious life as significant partners in religious dialogue, yet without having to grant them a religiously sanctioned right to the forms of life they have elected to live. Second, unlike the universalist religious aspirations of both Christianity and Islam, Judaism's, Judaism's theology of election does not sit comfortably with the argument from sameness presupposed in Nostra Aetate's call for dialogue and collaboration. A, Jewish, a respective Jewish call for such dialogue cannot be grounded in what we might have in common with the religious and irreligious other. But if Judaism is incapable of viewing people as possessing a fundamental right to their religions and cultures, as does Dignis, Dignitatis Humanae, and lacks the kind of universalist presumption of religious sameness that grounds Nostra Aetate, what in principle could serve as a religiously viable incentive for such a call? This is the question I wish to grapple with, and to do so as my uh, uh, Kippah indicates from the traditional perspective of rabbinic Judaism. To this end, I would like to look briefly at rabbinic Judaism's two most important scales of perfection. In the public communal realm, that of the development and perfecting of religious law, of halakha. And in the personal intra-subjective realm, that of the perfecting or halakhically cleansing of the self. At the high point of each, we shall see, the other is engaged in a crucially important role. At the opening sections of Tractate Eduyot, Tractate Eduyot, mean, Eduyot means testimonies. Uh, so the opening sections of Tractate Eduyot of the Mishnah, the canonical early third century halachic compilation, uh, formative of the entire Talmudic literature, raises the following interesting question. Why, given that the law is always decided by majority vote, why do we nonetheless insist on keeping explicit record of rejected minority opinion? The Mishnah offers two contrasting answers. Presenting the one it adopts the one it adopts as that of the majority and the one it rejects as that of the minority voice of one Rabbi Yehuda, son of Eli. One answer asserts that the reason for keeping and reject the rejected minority opinion on the books is to ensure that it remains firmly, firmly rejected. If in the future a person should claim that the law is thus and so, we will be able to prove to him that his was a minority opinion against which the minority of rabbis had ruled differently. Rejected minority voices are metic meticulously recorded, if you wish, in order to ensure their rejection. According to the second answer, it is important to keep good record of the dissenting voices of the tradi tradition just in case future rabbinic authorities will want to overturn their predecessor's majority voice, ruling, uh, majority ruling, by reviving the approach rejected. According to this very different view, minority opinion is recorded in order to be kept alive as a viable, revivable halachic option. The two answers to the Mishnah's seemingly innocent question of explaining why halachic tracts should record opinions other than the ones they adopt, represent a profound disagreement regarding the very, very nature of halachic development. The first approach views halachic rulings as irrevocable, as fixed forever, and strictly binding on all future generations of halachists, firmly limiting their legislative authority to lacunae with regard to which no existing ruling can be found. 
And of these questions, too, once decided, and on these questions, too, once decided, the matter will be considered settled and binding once and for all. The second approach views the halachic authorities of each generation as charged with full legislative, not merely judicial, responsibility. It considers it their religious duty not only to transmit and to occasionally supplement the system of law they inherit, but as true lawmakers should, to hold it in constant review and uh, uh, changing it as they see fit. And you can't have it both ways, nor is there a third immediate option, as some of my critics have tried to suggest in the past. Existing halachic rulings can be considered as le the legitimate objects of, or as immune to, later rabbinic criticism and revision, but not as both. As I said, the Mishnah presents one of the two views as the majority opinion, and hence as the one it endorses as halakha, and the other as that of the minority and hence rejected voice of Rabbi Yehuda bar Eli. You may be surprised to learn that the option, that, that the opinion the Mishnah endorses is the reformative approach of halakhic revisionism while relegating halachic traditionalism to the rejected opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. The Mishnah's firm ruling in favor of re a reformative view of Jewish law must sound uh, 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 surprising to some of you, coming as it does from the heartland of rabbinic Judaism, but as we shall see, it gets even better, for there's a cat. To see this, let's move on to the next stage of halachic development immediately following the Mishnah, most prominently represented by the most important work of early rabbinic Judaism, the 6th century uh, Babylonian Talmud, and to what I take to be its most distinctive yet misunderstood feature. In one undisputed sense, perhaps, the most important sense, the Talmud can be said to fully comply with the Mishnah's reformative approach. It is the sense we call in Hebrew mivchan hatotza'ah, or the test of the outcome. The Talmud is redacted in the form of often heated arguments between generations of later Amoraic sages who comment, ponder, deliberate, and expound extensively upon each of the Mishnah's rulings. What I mean by the test of the outcome is that when one when one honestly compares the state of halakha the Talmud leaves us with, with the Mishnaic system from which it sets forth, there can be no doubt that at least de facto, the Talmud's decisive contribution to halakha is thoroughly reformative, even dramatically so. Yet when instead of examining the Talmud's conclusions, one examines the discussions that, they are, that are purported to yield them, a very different picture seems to emerge, for the Talmud never, ever openly confronts a Mishnah or any other Tanaitic source in the way one would expect true legislators who consider themselves authorized to change the law to do. Rather, earlier Tanaitic rulings are pondered and analyzed and interpreted just as supreme justices would deliberate the law, powerless to change it, yet responsible to applying it adequately. However, a closer look reveals that in very many cases, far too many for comfort, the interpretations offered are far-fetched to the point of disbelief. Here's one wholly typical example in Tractate Sanhedrin, Folio 41a, for those taking notes. Rabbi Chizda, and, and this is so typical, um, really. Rabbi Chizda, a major early 4th century Amoraic sage, is reported to have ruled that if under interrogation the testimonies of witnesses to a murder turn out to contradict each other with respect to the murder weapon, such as if one testifies that he killed him with a sword and the other that he killed him with an axe, I quote, their testimonies cannot be accepted and the case is dismissed. However, if their testimonies fail to cohere with respect to what the murderer was wearing, for example, such as if one testifies that he wore white while the other's claims he wore black, their testimonies are to be accepted and the case heard. 
which makes a lot of sense because if you suddenly witness somebody chopping somebody's head off, uh, you won't be paying attention to, say, the color of his jeans. An objection to Rabbi Chizda's ruling is then raised in the form of a Tanaitic source that claims contrary to him that if one, witness, if one witness testifies that the murder weapon was a sword and the other claims it is an axe, or if one testifies that the murderer wore white and the other that he wore black, in both cases, the case will be dismissed. To this, Rav Chizna responds not by reasoning against the source and explaining why he saw fit to dismiss the former reeling, ruling and change the law, but by radically reinterpreting the Tanaitic source as referring not to the case in which their testimonies differ with regard to the murderer's clothing, but the very special far-fetched case in which they testify that the, murders, the murderer's garment happened to be the murder weapon itself such as when they testify that he strangled him with the cloak. Now, this is a typical example of a far-fetched reinterpretation rather than an argument against the Tanaitic earlier rule. Now, I shan't mince my words. Rabbi Chizda's interpretation of the Tanaitic ruling is far-fetched to the point of absurdity. Had the garments mentioned in the ruling's second clause been meant to represent murder weapons, then the entire second clause would have been superfluous because we've already ruled on weapons. This is not a strained reading, it's an unfounded one. And what's so worrying about it is that such readings are so common in the Talmud's halachic discourse that seasoned students no longer give them a second thought. Yet given the logical rigor of that discourse, one cannot brush them aside as mere lapses of rationality. What renders the question especially vexing is the fact that far-fetched interpretation seems to make no sense at all from either view of halachic development and authority that I mentioned above. Neither traditionalists committed to comply with the law as they, found it, as they find it, nor Mishnah-type anti-traditionalists at liberty to reject and replace ruling they deem wanting would ever have reason, it seems, to radically reinterpret their predecessors' rulings. Or so it seems. I said before that when one compares the halachic system the Talmud leaves us with, with that of the Mishnah from which it sets forth, it is hard not to char characterize its project as thoroughly reformative. Which of course sits nicely with the Mishnah's own reformative position, but here's the catch. According to the Mishnah, Halachists can change the law, but they can never really reform the system. They can overturn and replace a current ruling, but they cannot obliterate it. They can overthrow rulings they find objectionable, but cannot declare them null and void. Rulings they reject aren't erased, only demoted to the status of minority opinions, where, the, where though not currently in force, will remain forever part and parcel of the halachic tradition to be studied, transmitted from generation to generation, and therefore always liable of being restored. As strongly as halachists may feel against the former rulings they reject, they are, they are powerless as legislators, or I'd even say as mere legislators, to eliminate them from the record and render them not merely rejectable, rejected, but unviable. It is from this perspective that I think the Talmud's widespread practice of far-fetched, often unfounded halachic reinterpretation may be made better sense of. For conscientious legislators, the process of halachic change does not necessarily end with the making of a new and different ruling. Legislation itself is often only the formal first step in a longer and more significant reform process during which certain rulings, norms, and halachic sensibilities do not merely cease to be the law by formal acts of lawmaking, but cease to be considered a live halachic option by other means. And radical reinterpretation, I suggest, is one other mean. By, referring not, by, by preferring not to openly rule against the Tanaitic source, but to reinterpret in accord with his own position, 
Later authorities, like, the Rabbi, like Rabbi Chizda, stand a very good chance of achieving what no measure of legislative authority is in principle capable of achieving within a reformative setup, namely the eradication of the source's original position from the halachic, halachic record and hence from the halachic tradition and hence from halachic memory. By arguing against a position, however vehement, vehemently, one preserves it and gives it voice. By reinterpreting it in the lines of one's own position, one's own position remains the only one <coughs> on the books. Had space allowed, I would have brought to the table a number of extensive and detailed Talmudic discussions of Mishnaic, of whole Mishnaic bodies of law, in which under the guise of innocent pondering, the Mishnah is so radically transformed by reinterpretation as to effect major halachic revolutions. To paraphrase the name of the famous movie, in this way, time and time again, the Mishnah's original positions are deliberately lost in interpretation, as it were, lost from the halachic record, purged from the halachic tradition, no longer preserved as a minority view. This, I believe, is how the Talmud performs the lion's share of its halachic work. But sometimes even harsher methods are needed. Some particularly blatant halachic rulings do not lend themselves so easily to radical reinterpretation. I am referring to rulings that are considered not merely mistaken or wrong-headed or ineffective, but downright offensive. Which brings me to the third and highest rung on the scale of halachic perfection, and with it, just in case you were beginning to wonder, the main point of this long section. These are cases in which a method of purging even more radical than radical reinterpretation is called for. Here's a brief yet potent example. The Jerusalem Talmud, the 5th century Yerushalmi, relates the following story about the great sage of old, Rabbi Shimon ben Shattach, who we are told had to work extremely hard in the cotton business to make a living. His students decided to purchase him a mule, which he could then hire out and be able to devote more time to his studies. And they did so only to find to their surprise that the Syrian from whom they had bought it had not noticed a precious gem lodged in its harness. Now, Master, they announced joyfully, you will no longer have to work at all. Did the owner know he was selling the gem with the mule, inquired Rabbi Shimon. No, they answered, of course not. Then return it immediately, he commanded. But one is permitted by law to keep it, they exclaimed, which is absolutely true. For according to Halakha, explains the narrator, a Jew is not obliged to return the lost property of a Gentile, only that of another Jew. Do you take me for a barbarian, stormed the same. Again, do you take me for a barbarian, stormed the sage, putting an abrupt end to the conversation. Now, what is fascinating about this little yet most significant tale, strategically placed at the heart of the Yerushalmi's discussion of the laws of property, in which it is ruled that Jews are not required to return the lost property of, of, of non-Jews. Okay, what's most significant is the way an objectionable yet bona fide halachic ruling is not questioned, is not reinterpreted, nor legislated against, all of which would have left it on the books as a viable option of some sort. It is not even hailed a mistake. It is left on the books as the law its obnoxious original meaning intact for all to see, but declared barbarous. A law indeed, but a law only a barbarian would follow. Maimonides, the great halachist and codifier of the 13th century, presents the same kind of move in his great halachic work in stark oxymoronic formulation. It is permitted, he rules, to work a Gentile slave with rigor, 
the, 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 the term in Hebrew is bafarech. I mean, this is the word used um, uh, with, 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 the slavage, with the slavery and bondage of Israel in Egypt. So it's, it's allowed, it's permitted by halacha to work a Gentile slave with rigor, he rules. Yet those who do so, he storms, display the kind of cruelty and aggression found only among heathen idolaters. Again, as with Rabbi Shimon and his students, the law that permits Jews to work their non-Jewish slaves rigorously is declared impious, unwise, unmerciful, and unjust, a law befitting of idolaters. Here again, the objection will halacha is not ruled against or reinterpreted. It is left on record as the law, but is rendered ineffective and, if, and as effectively as possible unrevivable by being utterly morally stained. So over and above the keen reformative work of legislators and interpreters, the law is thus also kept in check by subjection to the kind of moral extra halachic critique that we have witnessed. But by what code and according to which values is this kind of moral critique to be leveled? And, and this is my main point. How does the tradition gauge what is to be considered barbarous, unjust, unwise, and unmerciful? And what is, what is it to be considered the will of God? By what and by whose ethical code? The giveaway phrase is found in the very last summarizing sentence of the Talmud's account of Rabbi Shimon and his mule. The great sage refused to keep the gem and declared doing so barbarous and declared doing so to be barbarous, explains the Talmud, because the great rabbi, and I quote, was willing to relinquish all the riches of the world just to hear people declare, blessed be he God of the Jews. The moral standard against which halakha is to be measured, in other words, is that of the Gentile looking on, rather than that of the Jew. In developing halakha, and especially in the moral critique of existing halakha, the halakha's first obligation is to what in a different context, as we shall see in a moment, the Talmud refers to as to sanctify God's name. The term it uses in that context to mean being forever open to the world, attentive to how our laws, our normative choices and conduct appear, sound and morally resonate outside the boundaries of the halakhic community. To sanctify God's name is to transcend the all too cozy, all too self-righteous and self-congratulating dialogue conducted by Jewish halachists among themselves. Not by vainly claiming to speak in the name of God's attributes or in the name of the one true timeless moral code of the Torah, but by attempting far more modestly to create an inner distance from what we take for granted by prudently attempting to see ourselves as others do and to try prudently to live up to the standards of the rest of the civilized world as we find it. This is because others are capable of giving us what we are in principle unable to give ourselves, a truly critical perspective from a genuinely different point of view. And we talked about this at the noon seminar today a little. A third Talmudic passage makes the point nicely in a different and perhaps more subtle way. The law of damages states that the owners are responsible to compensate for injuries inflicted by their oxen and other oxen. However, in the case of a first offender, as it were, the ox regarded innocent and its owner is charged for only half the damage. Owners of oxen with a history of violence are expected to be more cautious and in the case of a goring must pay the full cost. However, this applies only to Jews, claims the Mishnah, where an ox belonging to an Israelite has gored an ox belonging to a Canaanite, rules the Mishnah, there is no liability. Whereas, where an ox belonging to a Canaanite gores an ox belonging to an Israelite, whether innocent or with a history, the compensation is to be made in full. Now, how can this be, asks the Talmud? 
Either the law of damages applies to Gentiles or it does not. If it does, they should be com compensated in the case of injury to their oxen like anybody else. And if it does not, they shouldn't be required to compensate others when their oxen are to blame. But you can't have it both ways. The Talmud offers two alternative explanations. The law, both admit, is indeed blatantly unfair to non-Jews, but the Gentiles deserve to be treated thus because they were offered the Torah and refused it, claims one answer. And because of their mistreatment of the Jews, claims the other. At this point, without any forewarning, comes the story of two benign legal experts sent by Rome. Our rabbis taught the government of Rome, and I'm quoting now, had long ago sent two commissioners to the sages of Israel with a request to teach them the Torah. They read the Torah once, twice, and thrice. Before taking leave, they made the following remark. You have gone, we have gone through your entire law carefully and have found it correct with the exception of this one point. Your ruling that if an ox of an Israelite gores an ox of a Canaanite, there is no liability, whereas if the ox of the Canaanite gores the ox of an Israelite, whether innocent or not, compensation has to be paid in full. In no case can this be right, for if the law is meant to apply only to thy neighbor, i.e. to Jews, then in the case of the ox of a Canaanite, goring an ox of an Israelite should not have been the exception. I'm, 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 I'm really because what, what, what these legal experts from Rome are doing are, is to replicate exactly the discussion of a few lines up already conducted by the Talmud. So why then, even in the case of an ox of an Israelite goring an ox of a Canaanite, should there be no liability? They leave the question hanging and then declare, we shall, however, not report this matter to the authorities in Rome, and they leave. <laughs> now, this is a wonderfully subtle Talmudic moment in which, by means of a story inserted in the, in the detailed legal discussion, the student and reader are allowed a serious peek at how the system they are committed to and committed to defend and justify looks like from the point of view of a friendly moral outsider. <coughs> and the picture ain't at all pretty. What renders this particular Talmudic moment truly fascinating is the way the story is left to hover and to cast its dark and worrying shadow over the self-congratulating discussion without need for another word. Okay? And, and halakha isn't changed. It's stained by that story, just as the two former examples. So much for the scale of halakhic perfection. I now turn to tractate Yoma very, very briefly, of the Babylonian Talmud, which vividly describes the four main levels of and means for personal deontic self-cleansing. Transgressors of positive commandments need only to repent, and they are forgiven and cleansed on the spot. For transgressors of prohibitions, i.e. negative commandments, however, repentance alone does not suffice, but only to suspend their judgment until the day of atonement, and then they are forgiven. With respect to transgression, transgressions of prohibitions punishable by death, okay, repentance and the day of, opponent, of, of atonement, atonement can only suspend punishment and further suffering completes the atonement. But those guilty of the profanation of God's name, Chilul Hashem, then pen penitence has no power, I'm quoting now, to suspend punishment, nor the day of atonement to procure atonement, nor suffering to finish it, but all of them together suffice only to suspend the punishment, and only death itself will grant atonement. The four-rung scale of offenses and their personal purging culminates in the very gravest of religious offenses, worse than murder, worse than adultery, worse than idolatry, the profanation of the name, Chilul Hashem. 
set up sui generis as a category in itself, situated far above all other capital punishment offenses. Yet intriguingly, what constitutes the ultimate transgression is not determined by the Torah code, it transgresses. Not at all. Unlike all others, the gravest transgression of all is not defined absolutely but relatively, relative to how one's conduct is considered, not by Torah experts, but as before, by those outside the system looking in. If someone studies and restudies Torah, states the passage, attends to the disciples of the wise, but is dishonest in business and discourteous in his relations with people, what do people say about him? Woe unto him who studied the Torah, woe unto him his father who taught him the Torah, woe unto his teacher who taught him the Torah. This man studied the Torah, look how corrupt are his deeds, how ugly are his ways. There exists then a central Talmudic voice that full consciously locates the definitive corrective, the ultimate normative check on both Judaism's system of law and a Jew's personal contact, conduct in the moral critique leveled at them by the civilized other. Self-critique, especially normative self-critique, is severely limited, especially, especially with regard to basics. And it is here in the moral challenge leveled at us by adherence to ways of life very different from, even contrary to our own, that the Talmud locates the ultimate source of moral correction. And here lies, I believe, the basis for an authentic Jewish welcome, welcoming response to Vatican II. Now, a real-life example, very brief, may help better explain what I'm trying to get at. Some years ago, the Israeli Daily Haaretz published a detailed, pro a detailed profile and long interview with an ultra-Orthodox American woman employed as a rabbinic pleader, that's a barrister to the rabbinic courts in New York City. The interview focused on the built-in halachic biases against women and the ways of legally reasoning around them in, in the rabbinic courts. At one point in the course of addressing various gender-based asymmetries with regard to rabbinic conceptions of marriage and divorce, she noted emphatically, in passing, how due to the growing number of same-sex couples in the city in recent years, we have come to realize that serious couples can maintain perfectly equal and symmetrical relationships in ways we formerly thought not possible. Now, just, just pause with this for a second. This isn't an argument in favor of homosexuality, the gay community, or same-sex marriage legislation. In fact, I'm sure that as the ultra-Orthodox person she is, she most probably considers them abominations. Nonetheless, utterly sinful and religiously loathsome as she may take them to be, there is something vitally important religiously that she admits the gay community was able to teach her, which had it not existed, she would never have learned. So homosexuality remains for her a grave transgression for which nobody could be considered as having a religiously sanctioned right to commit. Yet thank God for same-sex marriages, she all but exclaims, for they challenge us by their very otherness. In other words, though she could never apply to the gay way of life anything akin to dignitatis humanae, she can and certainly does regard it in a manner closely akin to Nostra Aetate, denouncing it as profoundly sinful while learning from it a profoundly valuable religious lesson, a way of life wholly rejected while deeming its challenging presence a rare and unique blessing. Are there authentic resources for just such a double standard in the rabbinic tradition? In the light of the texts I've presented and many others, I sincerely believe that they are. For as we have seen, they bespeak profound acknowledgement of the vital and essentially religious need for the thoughtful outside critique of those whose normative commitments differ significantly from our own as a constant check 
on our habitual, on our habitual ways of thinking. Maimonides' account of tshuva, of repentance, could well have joined Shimon Shatach's purchased mule, the Roman legal expert's assessment of the Alachic law of damages, the outward-looking, essentially relativistic criterion of Chilul Hashem, the desecration of God's name, to bear vivid witness to such an approach. Only in the context of the trusted normative criticism of others is one capable of gaining a critical perspective on the self-congratulating and self justifying hold of one's own normative commitments. All these interesting passages clearly imply this. And these are the Jewish resources I would build on, the, or the kind of Jewish resources, there are, are many more, that I would build on, not only for engaging Nostra Aetate, but for going an important step beyond the firm interreligious boundaries to which, because coupled to Dignitatis Humanae, Nostra Aetate is made to apply. So let me end this address with the words with which I concluded another presentation, one delivered from the podium of the Senate Hall of the Gregorian University in Rome at the opening session of an unprecedented conference organized by the Vatican that represented like no other the Church's new commitment to serious religious dialogue with Judaism. The conference was entitled the first Roman consultation on Jewish and canon law and was devoted to norm making and norm changing in the two legal systems. And I ended my address as I did here by alluding briefly to the Yoma text. In the light of this I said there, participating in this conference acquires from my orthodox Jewish perspective a special religious significance. For there is an important sense in which by engaging in serious, open, and critical interfaith dialogue with the significant and important and other as the Catholic Church, that the name of God is sanctified. It is sanctified not because we purport to bring to Rome his one true word, but because there is a very good chance that we shall be returning home from Rome better equipped for the ongoing task of working it out for ourselves. Thank you very much. Well, my thanks to uh, Professor Fish for his stimulating and helpful remarks. I've been instructed by them, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to engage them. My remarks, brief, will summarize the state of the question in Catholic doctrine on Judaism and the Jews, and then respond briefly to some particulars in what Fish just said. Before doing either of those things, though, I should say something about standing and competence. Catholics, I think, which includes me, lack standing altogether to intervene in or rule on questions internal to Judaism. We ought never, even though some of us sometimes do, instruct Jews on how Jewish thought should go or attempt to legislate on questions that arise within Judaism. I think that Jews similarly lack standing with respect to matters internal to Catholicism. This sounds obvious enough, I expect, but it's important. In interreligious matters, there's often a fine line between critical engagement with what others claim and do commentary, challenge, mutual study and correction, the gaze and the judgment, on the one hand, and telling them how to be who they are, on the other hand. I'll try to stay on the right side of that line, as I think Fish also largely does. Competence is a different matter. I utterly lack competence to make informed comment on what the Mishnah or the Talmud say. I'll therefore take it that what Fish says they say is at least tenable. That was meant to be slightly humorous, but maybe it didn't come across <laughs> that way. The, uh, the state of the question then, briefly. One of the most significant developments in Catholic doctrine in the last 70 years has been with respect to Judaism and the Jews. It's now settled doctrine for Catholics that supersessionism is false and incompatible with other central Christian doctrines, which is at least to say that Catholics ought not think, even though some still do, that the coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the church as his beloved bride supersedes or annuls the covenant between the Lord and Israel as his chosen and beloved people in whom he delights. 
that covenant remains, from a Catholic point of view, valid until the end of all things, until the heavens and the earth are rolled up like a scroll. The church and the people of Israel then are and ought to be, it's a matter of blessing, not of regret or accommodation, now and for as long as the world shall last, intimately coexistent as lovers of the same Lord. This rejection of supersessionism does not, of course, remove disagreement. Jews and Christians differ about much with respect to the Lord, and it's good explicitly to acknowledge and engage those differences. Neither does it remove the possibility of conversion. Jews are sometimes willingly baptized. Gentile Christians sometimes become members of the people of Israel. What it does do is move Christian thought and practice toward a position in which the libels and slaughters that Christians have inflicted on Jews throughout much of our shared history are shown for what they are, a horrifying deformity close to the heart of the church and an occasion for lament and repentance on the part of all Christians. If we couple this development in fundamental doctrine with a positive duty laid on the church by Nostra Aetate, together with many post-conciliar magisterial documents, to engage in the study of Judaism and dialogue with Jews, a duty well expounded by Fish, then we have a relatively new and delightful situation for Catholics. The existence of Jews and of the Jewish intellectual tradition can now be understood as a blessing for the world and for the church, an occasion for learning and gratitude and a stimulus for the further development of Catholic thought and practice. These states of affairs always obtained, of course, but the church was, for large parts of its history, blind to them. With all that in mind, much too briefly said, let me turn now to the particulars of Fish's position. He argues, by way of engagement with Mishnaic and Talmudic texts, that Judaism has the conceptual resources, or perhaps better, some disputed strands of thought within Judaism have the conceptual resources, to go Catholicism one better. In what way? Catholicism, as he represents it, which means essentially Nostra Aetate plus Dignitatis Humanae, makes Catholics advocates of, first, religious freedom as a negative liberty, the freedom to do what your tradition and community require of you, and second, of the positive duty to engage in dialogue, as already mentioned. The principal rationale for the positive duty, as Fish presents it, is affirmation and preservation of the goods found in non-Catholic religious traditions. And these goods are recognizable to Catholics because they are goods held in common with us. The position is, therefore, predicated on sameness rather than difference. I don't think this is exegetically quite right about Catholicism, and I'll return to why that is in a moment. But for the moment, let's stay with Fish. Judaism cannot take, Fish says, the Catholic position on the question because it isn't able to affirm a rights-based commonality in the way that Catholicism can and does. What it can do, though, is show the importance for Judaism of knowing how Judaism appears to Gentiles. That's different from the position he attributes to Catholicism because it's based on difference. The point of knowing how your community appears to one that's not yours is exactly difference. Your community, as a matter of definition, can't appear to those external to it as it appears to those internal to it. But you can be instructed by the mode of its appearance to others and provided thereby with resources for self-critique and self-amendment that couldn't be generated by restricting your attention to what's proper to your own community. That's the point, I take it, of the example of the Roman lawyer's critique of Torah and of the appeal to the stability of same-sex coupledom by the ultra-Orthodox American rabbinic pleader as a means of performing Talmudic critique. Fish even goes so far as to say that the voice of the other provides, quote, the ultimate normative check, close quote, on the development of the tradition to which it is other. So far, Fish. In addition to saying something about Judaism, on which I lack both competence and standing to comment, he is, I think, though implicitly, commending the position he enunciates to Catholics, at least perhaps, while at the same time suggesting that what's said in Vatican II doesn't, and perhaps can't, make that position readily available to us. I'll conclude these brief remarks then by making five short points, some critical of the particulars of what Fish says and some not, but all responsive to them. First, on Catholicism. Fish's presentation is incomplete, I think, even with respect to Vatican II and certainly with respect to the longer tradition. The deep grammar of the Catholic position with respect to the goods of the other is located in the scriptural trope of despoiling the Egyptians. 
In the book of Exodus, the people of Israel is told by the Lord that when they leave Egypt, they are to take with them gold, silver, and clothes from the Egyptians and thus to despoil the Egyptians of them. The patristic tradition develops the trope by saying first that these things were needed by the people during their 40 years of wandering and second that they used them both to make the golden calf and to ornament the Ark of the Covenant, which is to say for both good and bad purposes. This is a lovely though also a disconcerting trope. As developed and used by the Catholic tradition, it's been applied to many things, including exactly the kind of thing Fish is talking about. That is, to the ways in which Christianity appears to non-Christians. I've attended to this myself. More than 20 years ago, I edited a collection of essays called Christianity Through Non-Christian Eyes, whose goal was exactly to make possible the kind of externally catalyzed self-critique Fish identifies in his Talmudic cases. What Vatican II provides, I think, is not a rejection of this ancient position, but rather a complement to and development of it in the direction Fish so well identifies. Second, on the internal logic of Fish's own position. Mostly what he writes emphasizes the importance for Jews of attending to the perceptions of and judgments about themselves by Gentiles. This is clearly so in the case of Rabbi Shimon's donkey and the unexpected jewel, as also in the case of the two Roman lawyers. That kind of attention seems to be what Fish is centrally concerned with. It's what his argument grounds at any rate. But there's also another kind of attention exemplified in the rabbinic pleader's appeal to same-sex coupledom. This isn't attention to the Gentile gaze or judgment directed toward Jews. The same-sex couple she has in mind typically don't have Jews in mind. What's attended to in that case is simply an aspect of Gentile life. That's much more like what we Catholics have in mind when we speak of despoiling the Egyptians. If something's useful, take and use it, whether or not it appears to be about you. But it's not clear, at least not clear to me, that the trajectory of Fish's argument supports that kind of attention to the other and he shows no clear awareness of the deep difference between the two kinds of attention. I'd like to hear more about that. Third, I wonder tentatively whether Fish's thought that the gaze and judgment of the Gentile provides the ultimate normative check, remember that phrase, on Jewish thought and practice. I wonder whether that isn't a good deal more than his argument actually shows. Something hinges on what's meant by ultimate, I suppose. But I should think that what his argument shows is only that Jews may, and sometimes do, appeal normatively to the Gentile gaze and judgment. If that's right, it means that such appeals are better categorized as an ornament, an occasional gesture, rather than as a final court of appeal. I'd like to hear more about that too. Fourth, it seems to me that Catholic readings of and responses to Jewish gazes and judgments directed toward ourselves are, and perhaps must be, very different from Jewish responses to the Catholic gazes and judgments directed toward themselves. For Catholics, Jewish gazes and judgments are necessarily intimate and important. There's no reason, or perhaps there is, I lack standing to say, but I think there's no reason to think this true in the reverse direction. Catholics, I suppose, can, for Jews, easily be subsumed into the broader category Gentile which means that our particularities aren't as important for Jews as theirs are for us. Maybe they're not important at all, but we can't subsume them into any broader category for doctrinal reasons proper to Catholicism. There's an asymmetry there then. Also, the history of violence between Catholics and Jews burdens each of us differently. For us, for we Catholics, it's a weight of grief and a reminder of how badly wrong we can go. For them, again, perhaps, I lack standing to know, it's different. A Jewish friend of mine once told me that his father taught him to cross the street whenever he came to a Christian church, because those are dangerous places for Jews. That's a burden of a very different kind. Fifth and last, I found myself worried when reading Fish by his rapid moves up and down the ladder of abstraction. Low on that ladder, we're told about the Bavli, the Yerushalmi, and Rabbi Shimon and Chizda. High on it, teetering at the top, the lesson is generalized, and we're told that, quote, 
Only in the context of the trusted normative criticism of others is one capable of gaining a critical perspective on the self-congratulating and self-justifying hold of one's own normative commitments, close quote. I don't think, I rather doubt, that we can get to the top of that abstraction ladder from the Mishnah and the Talmud. And I rather suspect, though tentatively, that Fish analyzes those materials in the way that he does because he's in fact already there, teetering at the top of the ladder and on other grounds, probably philosophical ones, extraneous to Judaism. I'd prefer that not to be the direction of his thought and would welcome instruction about whether it is. In conclusion, I'm very grateful for Fish's positive reception of Nostra Aetate and Dignitatis Humanae and for his ornamentation of them. His essay in doing these things provides an instance of its topic and that's always an intellectual virtue. Perhaps I've been able to return the compliment and in that small way contribute to what Fish and I both want which is the sanctification of the name. Even though we speak that name differently and with a profound incompatibility that will be resolved only eschatologically. Thank you. I think that would be great. So I would invite, thank you very much um, to both our speakers, and I would invite Professor Fish for you to respond briefly to it if you would like to do I so, and then I'd open it up to a conversation in the f 15 minutes remaining to us. Yeah. Your, your mic is on. Hmm? Your mic is on. I hope so, yes. Okay. My, my mic is on. Yeah. Um, First of all, Professor Griffith, thank you ever so much for the critical engagement. I, I mentioned a brief story at noon about the way the Talmud understands the famous saying, uh, um, make yourself a rabbi and acquire yourself a friend. And, and the friend is needed precisely because what the friend can give you is a different perspective and a critical engagement. And um, let, let me, so, so, so I, I, you know, I, uh, of course I welcome the compliments, but, but the critical engagement with the paper is, is, is the most valuable in your remarks, and thank you ever so much for that. Let me, let me start by the end. You, you, you sort of voiced a worry. Uh, regarding whether I, whether I was led in my readings of the Talmud by a latter-day philosophical position. And I certainly am led by a latter-day philosophical position. And um, and what I think both our traditions do is returning to our sacred text with renewed perspective in the light of events and the light of developments and the light of further understanding. And philosophically speaking, I think what's come to the fore after the linguistic turn, certainly for neo-Kantians like myself, and that is that criticism, reflection, rationality are profoundly framework dependent activities in the sense that to find something inappropriate that merits taking action requires a standard of, a standard of appropriateness in place in order to make that judgment and those kinds of judgments normative judgments are not judgments that we make conditionally or speculatively but out of commitment to the norms we are that really ground the self. Why is that problematic? It's not problematic to make such judgments, but what is rendered problematic is the rational affirmation of the normative system itself. In philosophy of science, in which I also work, 
the problem of rational paradigm shifts is, 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 is regarded as unsurmountable. I think by the vast, vast majority of philosophers, who sh at least those who share this notion of the framework dependency of human judgment. Now, my philosophical work in recent years has been to awake, it, it, I'm, I'm a kind of reformed Popperian, uh, in the sense that Popper makes much of criticism and rationality, but poo-poo's the idea of the framework. Uh, in, in in a manner which is, he is, I believe, unable to defend. And therefore, the, the problem of creating rational distance, critical distance from one's own commitments, that, that inner uh, 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 alienation, the inner distancing that's required for that type of normative self-normative criticism is impossible working alone. And, and my two cents worth in that discussion, and I published a book a couple of years ago called The View from Within Normativity and the Limits of Self-Criticism, is precisely about the, trans the potentially transformative effect of exposure to the echo chamber of the normative critique of others. How that works, I don't have time to get into, but it's absolutely crucial, okay, to be able to reflect on, seriously reflect on, criticize, and on occasion rationally undertake a paradigm shift or a paradigm modification. Okay, that's the philosophical chapter. For years and years, I've been fascinated by the dialogism of the Talmud, of the way in which the Talmud presents itself by argumentation, not by conclusion, but by displaying the way in which conclusions are reached, and by the, the span of critical engagement which extends all the way out into the pagan world. I mean, you, you, judging just by this paper, of course I build a whole generalized case on two or three examples. But those of you who are acquainted, at least a little, with the Talmudic literature, Roman emperors, generals, tax masters, prostitutes, laborers are engaged time and time again by rabbis. And there's something about the, 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 the chosenness of, of the Jewish people who, who don't engage the world in order to bring the world the good word. That the rabbis go out into these dialogical, they actually seek these dialogical engagements and, and come back time and time again having learned something from the legislators and so on and so forth, which they could not have learned themselves. Now, th this, is, this goes to the very, very heart of Talmudic Ju Judaism and to a notion of religious faithfulness and obligation, okay, which has to do with, an ob with a religious obligation to be ambivalated, okay, to be challenged. And of course, there's a difference between being directly criticized by someone looking in and making a comment or being challenged by a neighboring uh, form of life who is not talking about us. But being attentive to both and open to both has the same effect. And, it, and I realized, uh, uh, I'm still writing the book, the new book on, on the Talmudic literature, that this philosophical perspective suddenly opened my eyes to understanding this notion that lies at the heart of Talmudic religiosity, not merely lawmaking, but religiosity itself. And I could go on and talk about confrontations with the divine and with the halakhic tradition, and so on and so forth. It's a horizontal dialogue, sorry, horizontal dialogue in order to confront vertically, okay, which is, which is absolutely central to the entire enterprise of the formative canon of rabbinic Judaism. 
So yes, I, I, I think that through this newly acquired philosophical perspective, I'm able, due to the challenge of the new philosophy I'm working in, to reinterpret my own tradition in a way that suddenly offers a resource for the type, for the type of move of, uh, of Nostra Aetate, which we are not able to make um, in, 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 the ways, in the ways you describe. Um, I just say one, one, another half sentence, and that is when I read Dignitatis Humani and, uh, and Nostra Aetate, Green with Envy, it's not about the way Catholics can now of, have, have opened to dialogue with the Jews, but opened to dialogue with all the other religions. I mean, it wasn't the Jewish aspect of Nostra Aetate that interested me so much as, as the very notion of a religiously sanctioned, meaningful uh, engagement in dialogue. And that, that's what I was looking for, a religiously motivated um, uh, uh, notion of Jewish religiosity which would yield that kind of attitude towards the other. Okay, I, I haven't answered all the questions, but thank you ever so much. Thank you, Professor. We've got about five minutes. Um, so, and then, of course, we invite you to join us outside. So, I see a hand up there. I think that I'll, 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 I'll bow to Professor Griffith's um, uh, judgment. I, I don't know enough about Catholicism, Catholicism to comment on that. And if you're right, that's very, very good news indeed. I'm not, I'm not saying you're not. And I, 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 you know, I don't have the standing um, to comment. But, but reading through the documents and understanding what, you know, the little I understood from Dignitatis Humanae and Nostra Aetate, and I... I took place, I, I, I took part in a very large <coughs> conference in Rome celebrating 45 years. I think it was 40 years or 45 years. Not right now, <coughs> 2000. <coughs> 2000. <laughs> yeah. um, so, yes, I mean, I have my ear to the ground, but I, I am, you know, I, I have no authoritative knowledge. And perhaps there is a Talmudic strand in Catholic. Which, which resonates with what I can only speak confidently about my own tradition. Although the church is the new people of God, is, is Catholicism now the chosen people? Is the Pope saying that? I take it the text is saying just what it says. Um, so there's a number of images in the text of Vatican II for the relationship between the Lord and the church. Some of them are spousal, some of them are nuptial, some of them are images of chosenness. There are many, many, many. Um, so there's no easy way to summarize the ecclesiology of Vatican II, not to try and recapture that. Um, but what I would say is that um, all of those images, taken together in all their ramifications, are framed doctrinally in such a way as not to imply that the people of God that is the people of Israel is no longer the people of God. So it's both and, not by law. One more question.
The, the element I found omitted in the account of, of Nostra Aetate, um, and, and this isn't a criticism, this isn't a criticism of, of the document or of the church. It's just a statement to say that this, this is something the Jewish tradition has difficulty buying into, is that the value of the other is not in the critical challenge the other poses, but rather in, in because we're all one humanity and because religiosity asserts itself in different forms, we can learn from one another, not be challenged, but learn something new, perhaps, which we can add to our viewpoint. But the other isn't valued because he helps us to reflect and, cr and self-criticize and therefore change our basis. This is what I find in the Talmud to be profoundly central to the Talmudic. So therefore, this is the route I, I would insist Judaism can take in order to come up with the, with the same conclusion, and that is that the other, and in our case also the irreligious other, is... is merits, religiously merits engaging in dialogue because by the other's mere otherness. Supplement and compliment, I think this is partly right and partly not. I mean, I think about Nostra Aetate, what you said is right. Um, mm -hmm. That is to say, the other is depicted in Nostra Aetate as valuable to the extent that and because there is harmony between what the other says and what the church says. That's clear. That's the same this part. Um, however, there's lots else, both in Vatican II and in the Catholic tradition. And I'd like to underscore two things that one of which hasn't come up. Um, certainly, I think, if you look at, let's say, the practice of the medieval questio in the Latin tradition, and you look at the way, for example, that Thomas Aquinas deals with um, both Jewish and uh, Islamic interlocutors, much of what you're talking about is present there, I think. Mm -hmm. But other things are present as well, and in addition to the positive uses of dialogue so that the gaze of the other can help oneself to become a better version of oneself. In addition to that, there's also deep in the tradition and present in Vatican II as well, an affirmation that sometimes interreligious dialogue will yield the judgment on the part of one or another of the interlocutors that what there is here is simple error and it's to be identified as such and argued against. The traditional label for that would be apologetics. Um, and that's not ruled out by Vatican II either. Indeed, that is affirmed in parts of Vatican II as an appropriate so this, that's a different thing again, that sometimes what one finds is otherness that is in disagreement irreconcilably so. There's a whole range of possibilities here. They're all in play. I'm going to draw this part of our conversation to a conclusion, again with thanks to Professors Fish and Griffith, and then we'll go outside and have something to eat and drink as we continue our conversation. Thank you.
if we had longer to get into this. Hi. Hi. I just want to say again how much I enjoyed both the talk and the seminar. Malachi Thank sends you. his regrets. He has an event at the for your company. The, the, the Talmud as a can is favors the Hillelite position mm -hmm. according to which they are firm in their traditions and understanding they're sufficiently wary that they need the, an opposition right. they right. need the right. Shammites right. and, and therefore the Talmud in order to uphold and maintain right. I think I'm still broadcasting <laughs> Hold and maintain a firmly, a firm Hillelite position has to 